Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Just thankful for the grace, the access that you've given us, the opportunity and the privilege to fellowship over your word. I just ask that you would strike out anything that is error or foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Folks, I want to say right here at the outset, before I begin this next video on Romans, I want to speak directly to you about something that is of supreme importance. I've been told that these studies are just far too complicated by some individuals and so I want to just quickly respond to that my answer to that is is simply this how simple it is that God would have us know that his desire for us is that we trust in him and not ourselves. It's just that simple. My constant prayer for you folks is that you have ears to hear this. That we don't consider ourselves adequate as in the in our own capability, our our own strength to take in and accomplish that which God has accomplished for us through Christ. Now, we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and we left off at, at Romans 12, verse 3. We've looked at 11 chapters of doctrine that ended with the great declaration of the sovereign God in the last chapter in through and to all things and now we begin looking at the application of that doctrine in our lives I spent some time trying to point out that presenting your bodies a living sacrifice is not giving up something but accepting from God that which God has ordained for your life and so I find it interesting that the first thing that the Holy Spirit emphasizes after he's pointed out that our lives are a gift from God and directed by him, that you shouldn't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I can't say that I find it surprising that that'd be the first caution that comes after presenting your body as a living sacrifice these verses, folks, they all tie together. The reason that you don't think more highly than you ought to think is because you are you are not a self-made man or a self-made woman. You are a God-made man and a God-made woman. And you haven't really learned the basics of biblical theology if you don't understand that. And there, there are any number of Christians who read that uh, God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith and say that God dealt, well, he dealt one believer more faith than he did another, or he dealt, he dealt Paul more faith than he did Peter. You know, he, he, never, he never gave you, really gave you very much faith, or, or he dealt you more faith than he did someone else. You know, so some are doing the best they can, and in their own little, you know, meager way, their own weak way, they're going to serve God, and all kinds of junk comes from that. The text is not saying that. The text says that God's given every man faith's standard, that which is trustworthy, that which can be believed. It isn't that you have a a meager amount of what somebody else may have a lot of. That's not what the text is teaching. 
you have to face the fact that you are not a self-made person. You are a God-made person, and he's given you the standard measure of faith, and every child of God has received by grace that same standard. And that faithfulness is the faithfulness of Christ imparted to you as a gift. It's a gift from God. And to me, the text is saying, that's an equal gift to every child of God. The word measure is the Greek word metron, meaning a measure or a standard. Now, turn with me, if you will. I, I don't usually like doing this, but the same human author, Paul, Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. The standard is the gift of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. The standard is the fullness of Christ. For as we have many members, and, and this it's a present tense, we have many members in one body. All members don't have the same activity. Now, my, my Bible says office. The word means practice or activity. Well, that makes a lot of sense. God uses beautiful illustrations. We talk many times about being born again or born from above. We know that that birth is passive. You didn't have anything to do with your physical birth. You didn't have anything to do with your spiritual birth. And that ought to be absolutely evident from the illustration that Christ uses. Nobody decided to be physically born. Nobody said that they'd be physically born if they accepted it, and if not, that, well, they wouldn't be born. It's a totally passive experience for the baby, as is spiritual birth. It's by the will of God, and it's through the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with the human will, acceptance, rejection, or anything else. In the same way, we are one body in Christ, and anybody ought to know, members of the body don't have the same function. I don't particularly want you to lose uh, any functions of your body, You know, I've already lost a few because of, of the, the several horse wrecks that I've had in the past. But if given the choice, I'd much rather lose a toe before I lose an eye. But I, I'm not in any way suggesting that the eye is, is much more important than the toe. It just has a different activity, a different function. And clearly, clearly, the text is saying it is not our option to say, I never want it to be a toe. Uh, I, I, never, I never want to be a hand, or I never want to be a foot. The body doesn't function that way. The toe diligently does what it ought to do. The finger does what it ought to do, and the eye does what it ought to do and so on and so forth. We have many members, but it's one body. I may not be doing a very good job of getting this point across, but God has assigned each one of us different functions, offices, activities in the body that best suits the growth of the body, that serves the body. God's done that. Think about it for a minute, folks. If, if it had been left up to the individual Christian, the, each one of us as believers to choose, to pick and choose, or to, just to decide, to make that decision as to how we are going to function within the body of Christ, you know, well, I'm, you know I, I choose to be an I. And someone else says, well, I choose to be a foot, and so on and so forth. Can you, can you just stop for a moment and imagine what a mess everything would be? 
The text appears to make crystal clear the fact that no matter what our function, our office, our activity, which God deems necessary for the function of the body, every member has received by grace. It came from somewhere. We didn't elect it. We didn't choose it. We didn't determine it. We didn't decide it. It came from God, a sovereign God. It came by means of grace. It was, in essence, a gift. The same standard or measurement of faith, which is the faithfulness of Christ whereby the body operates. That's what I'm seeing in our present text. And that seems to tie in beautifully with our presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable, logical service. This also ties into the fact that, you know, as we've learned that we were made righteous by the obedience of Christ, not by anything we did. This also ties into the fact that our lives are directed by the sovereign will of God and that he works all things in accordance with his own good will and pleasure. That's what the text is teaching us. I've, I've mentioned before, these things are built precept upon precept. We come to understand what we're reading, what we're looking at, what we're studying. We, we, we come to understand it I believe the we come to, we come to realize we come to see the message that the Holy Spirit intended to convey when we have something to build upon and that is doctrine and of course I've mentioned this before doctrine most Christians consider that a an ugly word everywhere I go I, I I'm asked the question you know uh, you know, what do I have to be, uh, what do I have to do to be born again? And, and I always give the same answer, nothing. I'm born again by the will of God, not by anything that I do. I'm made righteous by the obedience of Christ, not by anything I did. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 states that we are all partakers of that one bread for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, that bread being our Lord Jesus Christ. And this 40 some odd number, uh, I counted 40, of injunctions that I pointed out in, in the last video, in the 12th chapter here. These commands, these instructions, these, uh, these expressed desires of God for our lives. These all stand, folks, upon the shoulders of, they, they stand atop the foundation of the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ in relation to his perfect finished work on our behalf. The astounding number, and, and it is an amazing number, of blessed doctrinal truths, which the first 11 chapters have introduced us to doctrinal truths whereby God's people who have been redeemed are saved, delivered, God's desire for his people being that they be delivered. Just as, as we hear Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, just as I try to please everyone in all I do, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of the of many that they may be, what, what, redeemed? No, saved. Saved. Where Paul is not speaking of redemption, but of the many, God's people, that is his elect, whom he has redeemed, being saved. I mentioned, I pointed out in the last video that I didn't, I suggested to you how that I believe that these all of these injunctions are not just floating on the page as laws to accomplish in and through our own strength. He's the vine, we're the branches. They reflect the very picture, of, they give us a picture, a lovely portrait of Christ himself. We're not under law. 
any instruction, anything that you see that 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 is the expressed desired will of God uh, for our lives, that is defines some characteristic, some character trait that reflects true godliness. This is the life of Christ, folks. It's not law. And I hope that I, in some way, got that point across. Surely I don't have to point out again that salvation and redemption are drastically different things. That, that salvation and being born again are different things. These people are elect. They are called and chosen. They're justified and glorified. But they're not saved. I've pointed out before that I believe how that the activity of the missionary, the activity of the of the ambassador for Christ, and we all really are ambassadors for Christ, is this is for the salvation of the elect, not the redemption or the regeneration of the elect. That's God's work. That's already done. That will be done. But salvation, as it pertains to God's redeemed people. Not the redemption or the regeneration of the elect, not the fact that they need heaven. They're, they're going to heaven because God chose them. They're going to heaven because Christ died in their place. I think that the greatest experience in my life was when I suddenly realized that God had redeemed me totally separate from myself. And when I realized that, and I trusted God for that, I was delivered from trying, delivered from law, delivered from concern, from judgment, from the conscious guilt of sin. If you believe that because of some sin that you committed, you're going to go to hell, then you don't believe in the finished work of Christ. You don't believe that he did enough. But the scriptures declare that through his death, you're made righteous and you have no more consciousness of sin. I was so thrilled that somebody brought that good news to me. To me. Someone whom God had chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The good news isn't that I have to do something to go to heaven. The good news is that Christ did it for me. That he did something. That's the good news. And if you believe it, you're delivered from trying, from fear of death, fear of judgment, fear of condemnation, works of the law, all those things that seem to plague so many, 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 many Christians. That is the whole purpose, the whole message, the whole intent, the whole reason for this ministry. Didn't start out that way. As you know, this channel did not begin on that, on that note. But this is where God has taken it. I had very little control over that. Why? Because God is sovereign. Just as he's sovereign over every member of the body and places each individual member of his body in the body as he so desires. So the good news is that Christ did it. Service, folks, is supported by sound doctrine. We can't dare replace it. Absent of sound doctrine, service becomes a heavy yoke of slavery. It becomes a burden that produces a synthetic, artificial righteousness that looks good on the outside. Apart from grace, the motive which prompts godly service is absent because law keeping has removed it. It's impossible to love if we don't feel loved by God. It's impossible to be graceful toward others if we, we are not ourselves sure of God's grace toward us. Or to forgive when we don't feel forgiven. To bless when we don't feel blessed. If we approach all of this from the standpoint of law, 
believing that our performance will earn us God's favor, our efforts will be in vain. It is not the hope of God's acceptance that motivates us. What motivates us is the assurance that God has accepted us in the beloved, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we present ourselves unto God that way, as who we are. The belief that God's blessings are attained through our performance makes no sense to us whatsoever when we come to comprehend just how much we've already been blessed. Think, folks, think. What sense does it make to be envious of another member of Christ's body when we come to understand our own importance as well as the, as the importance of others? which I believe is the thought the Holy Spirit is conveying to us here in our present context. So we're now dealing with the elect having different gifts, differing according to the grace, that is, by means of the same grace, same grace that's given to us all. The text is absolutely clear that you cannot declare that you don't have a gift. The text says every single one who's a member of his body has a gift, at least one. I don't know what that is. That's not my business. But I, I don't want you to miss the fact that it's a gift that's given according to grace. It doesn't have any strings attached. It wasn't given to you because of who you are or what you are, or where you are, but by the grace of God. And it seems nowadays there's such a little understanding of the grace of God. You were his enemy. You were not working for him. You were not seeking him. You were opposed to him. And in that condition, he laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, and he redeemed you. You didn't want to be redeemed. This is the God of grace. God is not dealing with you because he hates you. He's not dealing with you because he wants to make life a living hell for you. God is not dealing in, in any way in your life other than in love. As difficult to comprehend or understand that may be at times. God isn't working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure to make this life pleasant for you, but because he loves you and because your citizenship is in heaven. I'm sure I don't know what's best for you. I don't even know what's best for myself, let alone, you know, what's best for you. But listen, I know a God of grace, a God of love, a God of comfort who has dealt with you only in love, never any other way, no matter what the difficulty may, might be, no matter what the suffering might be. He's the God of all grace, and he gave every one of us a gift according to his grace, not according to our abilities. You're not a self-made man. You're not a self-made woman. You're a God-made person, and he gave you gifts. Look at what he's done for you. You're a member of his household, a member of his family. So every one of you has a gift. Not my job to determine what that is. I do believe that over time, over, over life, you'll begin to sense your gifts, if you haven't already, as modestly and as I can possibly put it, and, and as humbly as I can say it, I believe God has gifted me to teach. Years ago, I, I felt that. And since he had gifted me to teach, I was, I was just going to, you know, live my life with my butt in the saddle. I think I, I probably made it a little difficult for God, if such a thing is possible, getting me out of that into teaching the scriptures. And, and I don't know what your gift is. I'm convinced that it was given to you by the grace of God, and at some time in your life, if you haven't already, you are going to recognize the presence of that gift or gifts.
how much you exercise it and uh, and use it well, is another story but let's go on and look at this weather prophecy the first gift which he puts in a place of emphasis is the gift of prophecy and so let me clearly state without any doubt in my mind this does not mean predicting the future those commentaries that are written on the book of Romans that mention that you know I think are foolish without any doubt the use of this word is whether proclaiming the Word of God then do it we have an interesting few verses here we have first of all the aorist passive that he has given every one of us a gift we didn't choose it we didn't accept it we didn't decide to reject it God did it we didn't devise that gift we didn't train for that gift develop that gift it was given to us by grace and all of us have differing gifts that would lead us then not to look down on one whose gift isn't the same as yours but if the gift given is proclaiming the Word of God then proclaim it we got a, a, a whole bunch of prepositions in uh, epsilon nu in the Greek that's not I in English in epsilon nu in the Greek in and we have one kata if what is given to you is teaching then it, then according and I don't know how many translations that you know uh, that uh, I guess I've, I've heard there's over 500 English translations alone all of y'all's Bibles are not going to all say the same thing Uh, most of them will say according to the proportion of faith and well we have another excuse the first excuse we that we had was the measure of faith in verse 3 and, and I tried to explode that excuse you can't say that your measure of faith wasn't equal to mine or anybody else's that, you know that Paul had a much greater measure of faith than Peter it's the standard of faith that's based in Christ it's not articulated in verse 3 now we have something articulated in verse 6 the proportion of the faith and I'm using the King James for the sake of most of my listeners having then gifts differing according to the grace that has been given to us no argument it has been given once for all it's an heiress passive that gift may be teaching the Word of God proclaiming the Word of God if so kata according to analogia is the word now uh, you know I don't know what what you Greek scholars out there what you're gonna do with analogia the English equivalent analogous equal to that's what it says equal to so you know any number of people say you know they'll they'll say well you know you know I didn't have much proportion of faith so I can't do a whole lot of good teaching you know I, I try my best but you know your proportion of faith is much greater than mine folks that is not what the text says according to definite article the analogous the faith what is it the Word of God the faithfulness of Christ if you're gonna teach the Word of God make sure it's the Word of God and boy you gotta look I, I mean to tell you you gotta you 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 man oh man you gotta look for commentaries on the book of Romans that even mention this and they miss a marvelous truth that we who teach the Word are exhorted by the Almighty eternal God to make sure that it, it is the word and now well now I seem to be presented with a slight problem 
I believe that the, the scriptures teach that God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what the text says. And so here's an individual whom I, I think without question, he loves the Lord same as I do. I don't know. I'm, I'm not able to say. But my opinion would be that he was born by the will of God. And yet as far as I'm concerned, his life's work, guy wrote a book. I read the whole book, every chapter. Don't agree with any 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 title of any chapter. His whole life's work, his entire life's work, and we're talking about a lot of labor here, is error. Am I suggesting to you, and, and if I if I am, I don't want to, that God is not working in that individual to will and to do of his good pleasure. Many years ago, I, I felt that God had led me to teach the scriptures in a home Bible study. There was a bunch of us sitting around in, in uh, someone's living room. We kind of shared. We took turns, you know, using uh, one another's home, cookies, coffee, the whole thing, you know, all set around in a circle, put chairs in a circle. And uh, I used to love that. I really did. And and so I did that for a little while. And, and one day after the study, somebody walked up to me and they said, you know, if you studied this book, you wouldn't preach that way. And the first thing I did was get mad. Here I am dedicating my life to teaching the word and getting mad. I went home in my normal Bible reading and I'm, I'm reading about uh, Shimei cursing David. And Joab says, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to cut his head off. And David said, no, wait a minute. If God called him to curse me, leave him alone. And I, and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. If God called him to curse me, leave him alone. If God told that guy to say that to me, you know, I, I, I don't think I hardly ever taught the word uh, for years. Not really. Uh, I just, I studied it. It, it entered my mind that uh, nobody, not one single person around here was going to uh, hire me to train horses if I didn't study Monty Roberts, or nobody was going to hire me to break horses if, if I didn't have a few busted bones, and maybe I, I shouldn't teach the Word if I didn't study it a little bit to see what it says. I'm, I'm grateful that they didn't have YouTube. Oh God, how, I am. how grateful I am that they didn't have YouTube back when I first started to teach. There's no excuse, folks, in verse 6. It isn't, it isn't that God dealt a different amount to each person. What He gave us was His Word, and what we teach is His Word. You can't separate Christ from His Word. What is the faith we preach? The finished work of Jesus Christ. And virtually never, and I, this may shock some of you, and I tend to do that a lot, I know, but you know, I tend to slaughter one sacred cow after another, but I've got to tell you, I've just got to be honest with you folks, virtually never is the word faith in the Word of God, your faith, your personal faith. According as He has dealt to every man the measure of faithfulness, not your faith, According to the faith, analogous to the faith, and that faith is that which is taught in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. If your translation says according to the proportion of his faith, you know, as in, you know, your faith or my faith, that is not in the Greek. It's the faith, the faith or faithfulness. Again, I, I point out, uh, I do not believe there are hardly any cases, if, if any, where faith is your own. 
You know, I've often commented on Mark 11:22, have faith in God. I don't think it says that. Grasp firmly the faithfulness of God. That's what shores up your life. I see the same thing in Galatians chapter 2, 2, 2 uh, I've been crucified with Christ and I, I live yet. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in, in, the, in the flesh, I live by the faith of, that's not faith in, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you so much for all the kind comments that you're leaving on these videos. Thank you for all the, the emails, the encouraging emails, phone calls, and everything. All of the support that you've given us. We truly do appreciate it all. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for listening.